Okay, guys. Um, so Reza is not here today, which <laughs> means lucky you, you get me. Um, so before we start, there was a bunch of questions about how to turn in the homework, um, and so I guess there was a little ambiguity in the uh, slide from the first lecture. Um, so if it's a programming assignment, send me a copy of your source code. Um, if it's not a programming assignment, if it's just you know handwritten work, I don't need a copy. I don't need an emailed copy of that. Um, but I do need hard copies of everything. So of your code, of any figures that your code generates, of any responses to the questions, and then obviously any mathematical proofs that Reza asks you to do. Does that make sense? So I only need copies of the source code to the email account that's on the course website. Okay. You want, you want hard copy of like figures generated? Yes. Okay. Yeah. When you, uh, I I printed off my code. Mm -hmm. Uh, for this time, I'll let it go. Um, but did you submit the figures? Okay. Um, that's for this one. I'll let it go. But in in the future, please print out your code, any figures that uh, your code generates, and any responses to the questions that's needed. I, I grade the hard copies of it. It's just easier for me to go through and grade the hard copies and give them back to you. Um, but the the emailed copies are there. Um, just to make sure, one, that your stuff works and I don't have to retype it all, um, and two, uh, in case there's any question of cheating or anything like that, we have a digital copy that we can go back to and no one has anything to say about it. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, that's okay with everyone? Yeah. You can use whatever programming language you want, I guarantee you. If you can write it in it, I can read it. Um, that said, the vast majority of people use MATLAB, uh, so this one, the first homework assignment could have been done in about five lines of MATLAB code. So choose whatever language you want, but some of the programming assignments are much easier in one language versus another. And, and so it's up to you. But if you can write it, I can read it. Uh, I'm not worried. OK. Um, any other questions before we get started? OK. So last class, uh, or two classes ago, um, Reza talked about the perceptron. Um, and you did a homework assignment on it. So the perceptron, as you recall, for homework one, what you had was you had some series of inputs, x1, x2, all the way up to xn. Um, and they provided some weighted sum. So you had w1, w2, all the way up to wn um, as the input to a summation. Um, and then you pass the results of that summation through some nonlinear function. In this case, it was the sine function to get some estimate uh, of your output, which uh, we called y hat. Right. So that's um, sort of the simplest uh, of of all these sort of linear classification data sets. Right. And what this does is linear classification. You want to learn the weights such that you minimize some error between y hat, the estimated output function, and the true output function y, which in the case of the homework assignment was given to you. Right? It was whether or not the person liked the movies based on the features that we had selected previously. So our goal here is to find some vector of weights, w, which I'll denote w with the bar underneath it, meaning a vector. It's the same uh, notation that Reza uses, uh, equals w1, w2, all the way up to some, I'll call it w sub m transpose. Right? And so given a new set of data, so we, we provided you with a training set which featured 10 features for every movie, um, and you fit them. Um, but given a new data set, you want to see how good your algorithm um, works to classify that new data, right? You have a training set in which you find weights given some known outputs, and then you apply that to unknown weights. You want to predict whether or not people will like this movie or not. Um, and so how does this generalize uh, to other examples? So I'll call it, how does this generalize to other x? 
right? And this is the problem of validation, uh, which we're going to talk about today. Okay. So before we get into talking about validation, we have to come up with, um, uh, or we need a construct uh, that describes how much things cost us when we fail to predict accurately. Right? Our goal here, our first goal is to find w. Um, and given some vector of weights, how well does the w that we found generalize to new stuff? So the first step, before we can even talk about validation, is finding w. Um, and so to find w, um, we're going to, for the rest of the class really, uh, talk about cost functions, or as Reza uses the word, loss functions. So a loss function, which we're always going to use the notation j. j is going to be our loss function. Um, assigns a cost for being wrong. Right. And what you want to do is you want to attempt to minimize this loss function. this loss function, i.e., find w to minimize j. And so the theme, obviously, that we're going to keep coming back to through this class is, how do we minimize j? Well, in, a, in classical uh, calculus, right, j is going to be some function of the inputs and of our vector of weights. And so you're going to see, and we're going to see it multiple times, we're going to take the derivative of j with respect to w, set that equal to 0. And we're going to find the minimum point of that function. So we're going to find w where, j equals, where the derivative of j with respect to w equals 0. Does that make sense? So imagine we have some data set d. So d is composed of a series of um, x vectors, so x, some vector x at some point in time, uh, I'll call it 1, uh, and some output, which can be a vector, but in this case I'm going to call it a scalar, uh, 1, right, all the way up to x uh, bar or x vector at some time point n and y of n. So we, we're coming up with these, we have a data set in which we get pairs of values, x's being inputs and y's being the outputs of some unknown process. Right? So y's are our outputs, y hats are going to be our estimated outputs. Right? And so we can come up with a very simple loss function. So we can say our loss is going to be equal to zero when our estimated um, output, which is y hat in this part particular case, equals our actual output. So there's no cost to being right, right? But you can imagine that there would be a cost to being wrong. So anytime um, y hat is not equal to y, anytime our estimate does not equal our true output, we have some loss associated uh, with our estimate. And we what we want to do is we want to minimize this loss function this loss function being a function of some input vector x and some weights w. Okay? Does that make sense? So we're going to minimize this function x, uh, who has imp this function f, who has inputs x and w, uh, to minimize our loss function. Okay? So we may want to minimize our loss function over some training set, just like we gave you in the perceptron. Uh, learning homework, we have some training set, we've collected some sample of data, and then we want to find the weights that minimize that loss function. So in that particular case, the function that we're going to be minimizing, which I'll call j, is going to be equal to 1 over n, n being the number of samples that we have in our training set, times the sum from i equals 1 to n of some loss function. So in this particular case, we're going to make it a quadratic loss function. And we'll see that quadratic lo loss functions has, have some nice properties that we can then use um, later on. Um, so in this case, our loss function is going to be y on our output minus our estimated, um, our estimated y, our y hat. 
um, which in this case is going to be some function of x and w. And we're going to square it. Okay. So because it's a quadratic, we'll see it has nice properties. Uh, basically, we can find the derivative. And the zero point in the derivative is going to be the minimum of that function. So a lot of times, um, you'll see cost functions that are squared. There are cases where you don't have squared cost functions. In that case, um, you still do the same thing. You're going to find the derivative and set it equal to zero, as we'll see in this example. Um, but you need to do a little bit more work on the back end to make sure it's uh, actually a minimum. right? OK. So we're going to find w that minimizes j. And that wasn't going to close. OK. Anyone have any questions so far? OK. <clears throat> so we have some y. Right. This was the output of our system, whatever we're given, the, our training set. And we have some estimated values. Right. So what we're doing here is we're minimizing j, the cost function, over some training set. Why are we minimizing the cost function over some training set when we really actually want to test this data on another set of data? Right. So, so we have a training set in which we learn the weights, um, but eventually we're going to have the weights and we're going to want to apply them to something else, some different set of data. So why aren't we just fitting that test set of data? Well, for one thing, most of the time we don't actually have the y values, the output values for that test set of data. We only have a limited training sample. But in addition, we make some assumptions about that test sample. Basically, um, so why are we minimizing j over a training sample? as opposed to a test sample or some other, um, some other sample of data. Well, we assume that the training sample and the test sample come from the same distribution, right? They're independent samples from the same distribution. If they're, in, if they're from different dis distributions, learning weights over our training sample isn't going to help us very much for our test sample. But if they're from the same distribution, we assume that one choices of some input and the associated output are drawn independently and at random from some similar distribution in both cases. It shouldn't matter whether we uh, minimize j over our training set or our test set. Okay. We're going to come up with the same solution. So we assume that the training sample and the test sample are drawn independently from the same distribution. OK. So. Now that we've sort of covered all the things that we need to cover, we're going to go through some particular examples. So in order to, um, to solve one of these, uh, we're going to be calling them regression problems. And we're going to be going through a couple of different algorithms to solve the regression problems. Um, so in order to solve a regression problem, you need to do three things. The first is you need to have some hypothesis about the underlying model of the data. What that means is, is this linear? Is this quadratic? Is this some fifth order polynomial? Right? You have to have some hypothesis about how the data was actually generated. How do x's um, result in y's? Right? So what is the relationship between, in this case, w, the weights, and our output? Okay. Is this linear, quadratic, et cetera? Right? So that's the first thing. right? You, you have to have some hypothesis about how the data was generated, or, or you can't really go on from there. The second thing that you need right, um, is you need to specify your loss function. 
how do you penalize a wrong um, output from your generative model? Right. And three, now that you have those two things, you actually need to solve um, the minimization problem. Okay. So for example, <clears throat> let's assume that we have some jn, a loss function, which is a function of our weights, w, and is given in the same quadratic terms as we had before. So let's assume that we have some um, 1 over n times the sum over all of our n observations times y, or, uh, the summation of y, which is the output of our real process, um, minus some function, which is a function of x and w squared. Same thing I had over there. Right? So what does this mean exactly? Well, if we assume that the underlying model that generated the data is linear, we can rewrite this um, using our linear notation. So in this case, the i data point minus some w naught, which is a bias, right? minus some w1 times our input x1 at time point i squared. Right, so this is, this is sort of the simplest linear case. Right? You have a bias term, and you have a slope term. Right? So your weight vector, if you thought of the weights as a vector here, is a, is a two-dimensional vector. Right? It has two elements in it. One, the bias term, and two, the slope term. So things to note is that this function is quadratic in terms of w. Right? which, as I said before, gives us some nice properties of the derivative. Basically, we can find the derivative. And we know that the point where that derivative is equal to 0 is going to be some minimum. So what we really want to do in this particular case, we have two unknowns, right? w0, which is our bias, and w1, which is the slope of our line with respect to x1. What we want to do is we want to find the derivative d with respect to w0 of jn. Um, I'll just call it jn of w equal to 0, and some derivative also with respect to the first weight, the slope weight of jn of w equal to 0. And so we have two equations, right? We're going to set the derivatives equal to 0. We have two equations. We have two unknowns. We solve these two equations. We get our two unknowns, and we find basically the best w0 and w1 that minimize the error, the squared error between our observation and our predicted values. I'm going to stop there and see if anyone has questions. Anyone? No? Does that make sense? Derivative, we're just taking the derivatives with respect to w0 and w1 and setting them equal to 0. OK? So we have a minimum at some point in w space, right, in, in our weight space. OK. So let's, uh, let's actually run through this problem then, um, <clears throat> just because it's probably been a long time since calculus for you guys. Um, so we're going to run through this one, and then we're going to do the same thing, um, but in matrix notation, um, which uh, might be, hopefully will be a review of uh, matrix derivatives for you guys. So given this function, right, this quadratic loss function, which assumes a linear model, right? Let's find the w um, naught and the w1 that effectively minimize it, OK? So if we take the derivative, the board is uh, sneaking up on me. Um, so if we take the derivative of the function with respect to, which one did I take first? Let's do w1 first. Right. If we take the derivative, remember the derivative is a linear operator. right? And so when I take the derivative of this function, I can really just pass the derivative right through the 1 over n. right? So the 1 over n is just a scalar 
times the derivative with respect to w1 of the sum over i to n, right, of our loss function y sub i minus w0 uh, minus w1 x1 at time point i squared. Right. And again, the summation is also a linear operator, just like the derivative is a linear operator. And so we can take that inside the summation, and you get 1 over n equals the summation, or equals 1 over n, times the summation of i equals 1 to n of the derivative with respect to w1 of y sub i minus w0. Okay, and now we can apply the derivative, remembering the chain rule, um, and so we get one over n times the sum of. This is going to be because this is squared. We get our function on the outside two times y i minus w naught w one x one to the i times anyone minus x1 to the i, right? Everyone happy with that? And we're setting that equal to 0. <clears throat> OK. Let's do the same thing with respect to w0. This one's a little bit easier. And so I'm going to do it in two steps instead of three. So we get 1 over n times the sum of the derivative with respect to w0 of y sub i minus w0 minus w1 x1 sub i squared. Right, And this is going to be equal to minus 2 over n times the sum of y sub i minus w0 minus w1 x1 sub i. So the 2 came out in front, as did the negative sign for multiplying by the negative, negative 1. Right, chain rule. OK, so we have two equations. I'll call this equation 1 and equation 2, where this is equal to 0 as well right, from here. And so we have two equations. We have two unknowns. We can substitute one into the other, or however you like to solve these. Um, and you'll end up with the w0 and w1 that minimizes this loss function. Does that make sense? OK. So <clears throat> what's nice, what's nice about these two functions is that they actually tell us a little something uh, about what the residuals uh, in our model fit look like. And when I say residuals, what I mean is those pieces left over, right? There's always, yeah? So the need to prove that this minimum exists, like this system may, be, may not have a solution, I mean, for W0, W1. Um, like sort of problem. I think it's always going to have a solution because it's a continuous function um, and it's squared, so the derivative is known. Um, so uh, both of those two equations are linear in w1 and w0. So. Correct. There's, there should not be any place where w is undefined in this particular case. Does that answer your question? OK. It, and, and that's one of the benefits of a quadratic loss function as opposed to other types of loss functions which you can use. So in the quadratic fu loss function, right now, the way we set it up with a linear model, um, a as you said, the, the weights are always, you're always linear in W. Right? So you can find W0 and W1 to satisfy the equation. Yeah? Um, so is it always the case that you're going to end up having, like, say, a convex function where you could, say, have a unique Solution. In, in this particular case, we have a convex function. Okay. Um, do, but do you run across cases where it's not convex, or is it, I mean, do you have to use different things then? Uh, in, 
in this class, uh, I, I can pretty much assure you that it's always going to be con convex and you're going to come up with the minimum. Um, however, if your model is different, right, the, and we'll talk about different models at the end, um, you'll see that it's no longer linear in terms of um, in terms of the x's, but it is still linear in terms of the w's based on the, the weights, the, based on the way you set up the problem. So as long as you have a quadratic loss function, I think what I can say is it's always going to be uh, convex and you're always going to find a minimum, as long as you have a quadratic loss function. Okay? I'll get back to you on it, but I'm, I'm fairly certain that I can say that. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> a little bit of notation, um, just so that everyone's on the same page. So we've always had y. This is the output of our actual process. whatever that is. Our inputs have been x's, which have been a vector. Um, these are the inputs. And we have had some predicted output, which we've always been calling y hat. Similarly, you can have w, right, which is a vector. And that's the actual weights used to generate the process. And w hat, which are the predicted weights. So if you knew the underlying process exactly, right? if you knew it was a linear process and had some w's, right? you would, you would know w without the hat. Um, whereas what we're doing, the problem that we're talking about today, is estimating our Ws, estimating our Y hats given some series of inputs. Does that make sense? So the difference between um, Y and Y hat, the actual output and the predicted output, I'm going to define triple equal sign to be equal to Y tilde. Okay. So Y tilde is my is the error. Right. You can you can think of this as the actual. Uh, it's not the loss function, but it's the loss. It's the error that's associated uh, with your actual output and your prediction. Right? And so what we've had by definition thus far um, is that, continuing our problem up there, y tilde by definition is going to be equal to y sub i, so y tilde sub i, minus w naught minus w1 x sub i. Does that make sense? All I did was substitute in y hat, which we said was a linear function. Right? So based on that, what do we know thus far? Well, from equation 1, I can substitute in um, um, I can substitute in y tilde. So I'm, I'm bringing down equation 1. Right, which was 1 over n times the summation. Right, and so what I can say is that this is equal to 2 over n, I'm bringing the 2 out in front, times the summation of i equals 1 to n of y tilde sub i, right, the error, times minus x sub i, um, x1 sub i. And by definition, that has to be equal to 0. Right? Everyone see what I did? All I did was substitute in the definition for y tilde. Remember, y tilde is our error. So what does this imply? Well, what it implies is that, so the 2 over n doesn't really matter in this particular case, right? Because it's all equal to 0. But this says that the residuals, which is the error between the prediction um, and the observation, y, um, is not a linear function of x. Okay? So there's going to be no linear trends. Similarly, from equation 2, can everyone still see that? From equation 2, what we know, I can do the exact same thing, and I can say this is minus 2 over n, times the sum of i equals 1 to n, substituting it in now, I just get y tilde right, equal to 0. 
What does this imply? Well, it implies that, remember this is just taking the mean, it implies that the mean of all residuals is going to be equal to zero. Does that make sense? So what does that look like? Well, so if you had some x and some y tilde, the error, right? I'm going to extend this axis, right? You're going to have points whose mean is 0, right? These are the residual values for all of my x's. It's not going to be linear in x. I can't draw a line straight through uh, my residuals, right? When this is 0. But notice that this says nothing about higher order functions of x. So I drew it in a very specific way, right? This looks, I don't know, sinusoidal or something, right? So it says nothing about the higher order powers of anything. It just says that there are no linear, uh, there's no linear trend. Uh, in our residuals from the first equation, and it says that the mean of our residuals is equal to zero. Okay, so those two properties come out. Okay. Does anyone have any questions so far? Okay. So what we've done thus far, just to review, is we've talked about loss functions. In particular, we've talked about quadratic loss functions. Um, and we've derived uh, a very simple set of equations um, based on a linear model. right? And we've taken the derivative of that loss function, of our quadratic loss function, assuming a linear model, and found w0 and w1 that minimize that loss function. Right. Now, the way we're typically going to do that in this class is instead of looking at summations because they're rather cumbersome, is we're actually going to be looking at it in matrix notation. Um, it's a little bit easier to, to look at. And so I'm going to do the same thing that we did over there, no new concepts introduced, um, but I'm going to talk about it in terms of uh, matrix notation. So we're going to do the exact same process. We're going to define what our model is. We're going to define our loss function. And then we're going to solve the minimization problem by taking the derivative of that loss function with respect to now a vector w um, and setting that equal to 0. Does that make sense? OK, so a couple of definitions, just like we had over there. So let's let y, our output on any trial, equal to y sub 1 all the way up to y sub n. And just because this is the first time we've really sort of talked about matrix notation, I'm going to put down the sizes just so that you can see uh, how everything cancels out. Um, so this is an n by 1. I'll use lowercase. This is an n by 1 matrix. right? Um, and I'm going to say my matrix now, x, is going to be equal to 1's in the first column. This is going to correspond to our bias term in our weights, right? followed by some x on trial 1, x on trial 2, all the way up to x on trial n. OK? This makes sense. And I'm going to call this, and the size here is an n by m. This was an n by 1. Right. And our vector w of weights is going to be equal to w0, which is the same thing over there. It's our bias term, all the way up to some w sub m. So this is an m by 1. So what is our generative model in this particular case? Well, we can say that y is equal to some x matrix times our weights. Right. So that's all our generative model is. Right? Y is an n by 1, x is an n by m, w is an m by 1, and so what we get out is an n by 1. Does that make sense? So w0 being multiplied by 
the ones column, w sub n being multiplied by the mth column of uh, the matrix X. Okay. So given our generative model, what is our loss function here? Well, our loss function using the same notation as before, Jn of some vector of weights w was equal to, we've written it a bunch now, the sum i equals 0 over n times y minus w naught minus w1 x1 of i squared, right? Which we can write in matrix notation as 1 over n <coughs> times my, sorry, I forgot the i up there, times my vector now y. times my vector y minus x times w transposed times y minus x times w. So notice I got rid of the summation because the summation is now included in the, the matrix uh, multiplications. Right? And if you go through the, uh, the sizes, you'll see that it all works out. And it is still a quadratic loss function, right? OK? What this is equivalent to is 1 over n y tilde transpose y tilde. OK. <clears throat> so what do we need to do in this particular case? Well, just like we did over there, we need to take the derivative with respect to w and set it equal to 0. So Reza does this in the notes for the class. I'm going to do it in a slightly different way than Reza does it. Whichever way you choose to understand is perfectly acceptable. Um, this is the one that makes the most sense to me. Um, but you can take a look through Reza's notes and see if uh, that one makes sense to you. So JN of W is 1 over N times Y x w transpose y minus x w, where those are all vectors. I'm just going to apply the transpose operator. So if you recall from uh, your linear algebra course, to apply the transpose, I can just bring it inside uh, the parentheses. Um, but when I have a product, to take the transpose, I, take, I, I flip the order. So it's now going to be w transpose x transpose times y minus xw. Does that make sense? OK. I'm just going to multiply it out real fast. 1 over n times y transpose y minus y transpose xw uh, minus w transpose x transpose y minus w transpose x transpose x w uh, plus. Thank you, Max. Plus. <clears throat> Notice that this is a scalar. This is a 1 by n y transpose times an n by m times an m by 1 gives you a 1 by 1. So this is a scalar. This is a scalar. Right? And so to make things simple, I'm going to combine those two terms together. It's going to be y transpose y minus, I'm going to say w transpose. I think that's the way I did it. Yep, w transpose x transpose y plus w transpose x transpose x w. OK. I'm going to take the derivative with respect now to my matrix, or my vector, excuse me, w of j n of w is equal to 1 over n times the derivative with respect to my matrix w times this quantity. <clears throat> Okay. 
Yes. So, we have two lines of below. Yep. You say that uh, that quantity is zero unless uh, you put some extra notation. What quantity is zero? Y bar minus uh, x bar. Y bar. Minus, uh, two lines below that. Here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, what's that one? Is it zero? Well, you want this to be equal to zero, right? This is your error. This is the error between the predicted value and I should, if, if I was being accurate to the notation, I would say these are w hats. Yeah, that's my point. Uh, very true. Yeah, these are w hats. I'm estimating w's. Okay. Sorry about that. Yes. transpose x transpose y in that one? Yeah, two. two. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Two. I combined them together and didn't add the two. Okay. So yes, these are all, you can say these are all hats, right? We're estimating our Ws. Okay. So let's take the derivative. respect to w. So just to write it again, d d w of j n, which is a function of w, is equal to 1 over n times, I'm going to take the derivative as we do it. All right. So the derivative of y transpose y with respect to w is just 0, right? There's no w's there. So it's 0 minus 2 times, in this case, the w transpose is going to disappear because we're taking the derivative with respect to w, and we end up with x transpose y, right? And then we add the derivative of w hat trans, uh, transpose x transpose x w hat, right? Which is quadratic in terms of w, so the 2 is going to come down, and we're going to end up with x transpose x w hat. Everyone happy with that? Quadratic in terms of w, I'm taking the derivative, the vector derivative with respect to w. OK. <clears throat> if that does not make sense, please stop me. Setting that equal to 0, just as we did before. So now, what do I want to do? Well, I just want to solve for w. Well, so in this particular case, um, the 1 over n disappears, right? And I'm left with uh, 2x transpose y equals 2x transpose x w. <clears throat> the 2's disappear. x transpose x w hat. Okay, and so to find w, what am I going to do? I'm going to pre-multiply by x transpose x inverse. So x transpose x, that quantity inversed times x transpose y is equal to w hat. This is called the normal equation. You're going to see it about 100 times through the course of this class. And you're going to see that the normal equation is the result of a very large number of learning algorithms if you take the learning algorithms to their limit. Okay. So what does this mean exactly? It means that the perceptron that you used in class, right? if you, instead of having the perceptron and used a linear model or something like this. In the perceptron, at every point in time, we learned a little bit, right? You went through an iteration. There was some error. You updated your weights on the next iteration. And hopefully, you were closer to the actual value that was coming out. Here, if we have all of our data, and it's labeled, if we have y, right, and we know our output, we can immediately come up with our values for our weights, w hat, just by applying this equation. No learning necessary. One shot. You have your weights. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Okay. And that, that, does that generalize to multivariate Ys just by making Y and W respectively matrices? Correct. Okay. okay. Interestingly enough, a small aside, um, one other way to solve this, remember that Y hat equals X times W hat, right? Or we could say more generally, Y, um, we want our Ys to equal XW. And so if we have our Ys and we have our Xs, you guys may know something called the pseudo inverse, right? You can take the pseudo inverse of X, right? Where I'll denote the pseudo inverse as X dagger, um, right? Where pseudo inverse of X dagger X is equal to the identity matrix, right? And so if you do the pseudo inverse XY, times the pseudo inverse of x times x, which is the identity, equals w. So again, in one shot, you can find your w's. Turns out that if you look at the definition of what the pseudo inverse operator is, it equals x transpose x inverse x transpose. OK? Your homework today will be using the normal equation to find the weights in one shot uh, for a simple uh, classification example. Okay. That one is, again, due next Monday. OK, so let's talk briefly about polynomial regression. <clears throat> so we've done only linear regression. To do polynomial regression, the only thing you really need to do is change um, the definition of your matrix X. So previously, we had ones in our first column corresponding to the bias term. right? And we had X sub 1, X sub 2, or X at trial 2, X at trial n. Right? If we wanted a quadratic term in there, right? all that is is X at trial 1, quantity squared, X at trial 2, quantity squared all the way up to x at n quantity squared, where now our w matrix, our w vector, excuse me, is going to be equal to w naught, w1, all the way up to wm, just like it was before. Does that make sense? So to do polynomial regression, all you need to do is change your x matrix, right? So this will do quadratic, a quadratic polynomial. The normal equation remains the same. OK, so just to give you a brief introduction to fitting with polynomials. So <clears throat> generally, the fit improves. Can everyone see the screen just a little bit? Generally, the fit improves with increasing order of the polynomial. So in the first panel, you have a linear polynomial. Then you have a quadratic. Then you have a fifth order polynomial. And here you have all the way up to a tenth order polynomial, all with the same data. Note that the residuals go down with each one of these cases. But in general, um, you are likely, as your polynomial order increases, overfitting the data. Basically, you're, you're fitting the noise. So you want to find the best possible model uh, to describe the data. Um, and so. In this particular case, what you can do is you can do what's called a, a leave one out um, scenario uh, to do uh, cross validation. So if you fit your original data set and then leave one out, what you'll notice is that your error dramatically increases. Right? So if you're overfitting, if your polynomial is fitting basically noise, um, if you leave one of those uh, data points out, you're going to end up with a drastically different uh, amount of error. Okay. Whereas if the fit is appropriate, leaving that one data point out is probably not going to make that much of a difference at all. So one way to estimate whether or not you're overfitting is the cross-validation, which is quite easy to do. Basically, all you do is you go through your data. You leave out a data point. Okay. You fit your model, right? likely using the normal equation or whatever model fitting technique you're using. So you fit that model to, in this case, uh, the notation here is w of not i, the not ith point. You find w for all of the data except for that ith point. You fit the model, um, and then you find the error at that point. Right? And you take the average error for all of the data points. Right? You leave one out, take the average error overall. 
all um, the rest of the data points. And so um, you can find now your cross-validation error, which is the mean error at that data point that you left out. Okay? And so if your model is overfitting, what you'll end up with is curves that look sort of like this. Right? And so in general, um, if, the, uh, if the model is a good fit, Right, and you're not overfitting the data, increasing the order of the polynomial is going to bring down the error with each one of the each increase in the model order. However, as soon as you're, as soon as you start fitting data or fitting noise more than data, um, as your model order increases, you'll see a, a large increase in the cross validation error. Does that make sense? So in this particular case, um, the actual data was fit with a second these things really want to be up. Um, fit with a second order polynomial, right? And you see that the cross validation error is at its minimum for a second order polynomial and then increases on either side of it. Does that make sense? So it's one way to find the appropriate uh, model for your data, at least in terms of polynomial fits. Any questions? Okay. That is it for that. So we're going to talk now about a particular learning um, scenario called uh, LMS. And in order to do that, um, where did I leave off? I left off over here. Um, we need to talk about the difference between online learning and batch learning. Okay. This class goes till 4.15, right? Yeah. Reza stuck me with one of the longest lectures of the semester, so you get to enjoy that. Um, okay, so we had uh, batch learning. In which you're given basically a training set. You're given some inputs and some outputs, and you're given them all at the same time. So you have some big long list of your inputs, some big long list of your outputs. So given a series of inputs. and outputs y at once, as opposed to an online learning algorithm in which you're given a single data point which I'll call a pair of x's and y's at some time i might be a vector, depending on what you're doing. And you need to update your model accordingly. Or you need to update your weight estimates accordingly. So our normal equation here assumed that we had a big long list of y's and a big long list of x's. Um, and therefore, in one shot, we could figure out what the estimate of our weights needed to be. In this next problem, um, we're going to talk about uh, the LMS algorithm, which is um, <clears throat> stands for the least mean squares algorithm. It has a number of different names. Um, it's also called the delta rule. Um, and if you're in psychology, it's called the Rescorla-Wagner rule. They all mean the same thing. Basically, imagine that we have some system And we have some space, say x1 and x2 on our axes. And we get some input, x at time i. Right? And we can plot that as a vector in this space, just like Reza did during the first uh, class. I'm going to actually make this a little bit longer so things are easier to see. All right. So this is just a vector. It has some components, x1 and x2, that I've plotted in my two-dimensional space. Right? So 
we can imagine that there is some output y. Right? And so I'm, what I'm drawing there is some product, some unknown product, such that when you take the dot product with x, the length of this vector is going to be equal to y, normalized by the length of x. Right? So this is going to be y sub i. I'm going to change my notation ever so slightly, and I'm going to call this x at n and y at n. It's not going to make a difference, uh, but just to be consistent with Reza's notation. Right? <clears throat> so imagine that we also have some weight vector. Right? We also have some weight vector at trial n. So Previously, we only found one set of weights. Now, in this online learning algorithm, we're going to be trying to come up with a new set of weights, or the optimal set of weights, given the data that we have seen thus far. Right? And so you can imagine that what we want to do is if you take, um, if you imagine that our model is given by, I'll call this w hat, x times w, just like it was before. right? What you want is w times x, um, or w dot, uh, the dot product between x and w, to also fall on this line y. Right? Does that make sense? So just to give you some intuition about it, we can make this some angle alpha. Right? And now the question is, what is this? If I project w onto x, what is that? What is this distance? I don't know, I need a different marker. Not useful at all. What is this distance p? Right. So in this particular case, right, we're just doing the dot product. So p. P here is going to be equal to the magnitude of w times the cosine of alpha, the angle between them, where I've used this notation. Does everyone know what that notation means, the double bars? Um, that's The double bars is the L2 norm. So um, if, I, if I say the double bars of x, it equals the square root of the first element of x squared plus the second element of x squared, I'll make it squared, plus the third element all the way up to the mth element of x squared. Right, that's the L2 norm. Right, it's your distance formula. Okay. So <clears throat> given that we have this model, right? What we can also say is that w of n transpose, I guess I should, to be complete, we should say these are at some time point n, right? w of n transpose times x is equal to the magnitude of w times the magnitude of x cosine of the angle between them, which is, again, alpha. <clears throat> Right. So p is equal to magnitude of w times cosine alpha. w transpose x is the angle between uh, w and x times their magnitude. And so what we can do is we can say that just by simple substitution, cosine of alpha is equal to w of n transpose x bar over the magnitude of w and the magnitude of x. Boy, that's a lot of lines. So what is this? Well, that top part is y hat at time point n. So this distance p of w projected onto x, right? that distance is equal to y hat right, 
divided by <clears throat> uh, the magnitudes of w and x. So what do we want? Well, we have an error in this particular case, right? Our output was y, somewhere on this line. And our predicted output was the projection of w hat onto x at time point n. So we made, we made a mistake. There's an error here. And so in order to get the output to fall on this line, we need to change our weights on the next trial um, by some amount so that when, the projection, when, we, uh, when we project our new w hat of n plus 1 onto x, it falls on our line y. Right. So we need to add some delta w so that w of n plus 1 results in the projection falling on the line. And so one of the easiest ways to do that is just project it, um, <clears throat> uh, find a, a path parallel to x. And that's what we're going to do here. Okay. I'll put that one up at the top. So in this particular case, This is also, um, if you're at all confused about the picture, um, there's a very nice um, explanation of it um, in Reza's book, if you've picked it up already. So what is delta? Right? How, how much do we need our, to change our weights by? Well, delta on trial n is equal to the error, right, which is yn over the magnitude minus y hat of n over the magnitude of x. Right, that was just that distance. Right, that's that's how long I need to add on to it. Right, but in what direction do I need to add it on? Well, I need to add it on in the direction of x. And so to do that, I just multiply by x on trial n divided by the magnitude of x at trial n. So this gives me the magnitude of the error. This gives me the direction of the error. I'm adding it on parallel to x. Does that make sense? So this is a unit vector with direction x. Okay. And so very simply, now w at time point n plus 1 is w at n. Remember, because w of n plus 1 equals w of n plus delta. I'll put my hats here. Right. Plus 1 over the magnitude of x at n squared <clears throat> times y tilde of n, the error at n times x of n. So that's pretty much the LMS algorithm right there. Right? So we change our weights in the direction of x based on our error. OK? So we can derive something called the steepest descent algorithm. Okay. The steepest uh, descent algorithm assigns a cost function for being wrong, just like we did before. It's equal to 1 over 2n times the sum from n equals 1 to capital N. This is why I changed the notation. Of y on trial n minus some weights w hat transpose x of n squared. Very similar to what we had before. Right? So for a particular x sub i, we can take the derivative. So you can take the derivative with respect to, I'm sorry, some w i. Right? And you can take the derivative. It's the same as it was before. Uh, 1 over n now times the summation from n equals 1 to n, just like it was before, times y of n minus w hat transpose x of n times some x of i. Right. But if you wanted to take it for all w's, right, it would be the same equation, right? except now this is a vector. 
same as it was before, right? So this quantity, though, <clears throat> no, I took it. I put it to. Uh, I was sneaky. Um, I put the two out in front so it cancels, right? This represents the average error. <clears throat> over all data points. So in the LMS algorithm up here, we have the error on a single data point, whereas in the steepest descent algorithm, what we're doing is we're minimizing the cost of changing W over all previously seen data points. Does that make sense? So the LMS is basically estimating the, um, appro it, it approximates the, uh, the error over a local region. The, particular x that you've seen on this trial. Whereas this is going to change our weights based on our entire history of our weights w, or, or of our inputs x, excuse me. Does that make sense? So typically what you would do in this particular case, if you wanted to write the learning rule out, <clears throat> you're going to say that my w on trial n plus 1 is equal to w on trial n, just as it was in the LMS case. Um, plus eta, which is my learning rate, times 1 over n times the summation of n equals 1 to n of my derivative, which was y of n minus w transpose xn x of n. where eta is my learning rate. So the higher eta is, the more I'll learn from my error. right? If eta is 0, I learn nothing from my error. right? w of n equals w of n plus 1. So what we really want to know, and in the last uh, seven minutes or so, what we really want to know is in this particular case, right, when we were, doing, when we were looking at the normal equation, um, we found w's in sort of one fell swoop. In this particular case, we keep receiving new inputs, x at trial n, and we keep updating our weights based on the history of what we've seen in the past. Or if we're talking about the LMS algorithm, the delta rule algorithm, we update our weights simply based on the error that I've seen in this particular trial. Okay. What we really want to know is, what does w at some infinite time do? Given an infinite number of inputs, does w converge to some known value? Do we get uh, some stable condition um, for w? And so what, what we really want to ask is, uh, does w converge? Okay. So given an infinite series of inputs and outputs, does, does W converge? So I'm going to assume you have some base knowledge. Um, and I'm just going to give you um, some of the um, matrix series definitions that you need uh, in order to complete this problem. I think there is a homework on it on Wednesday that you're required to actually go through the derivations for it. I haven't looked at the homework for Wednesday, or the homework that we assign on Wednesday. But I, I think it has something to do with that, um, or at least it used to. <coughs> so I'm just going to give you the definitions. You can believe them or not. <laughs> uh, they do work. So imagine we have some weight at time point 1. And that's equal to some weight at some time point 0, plus given our learning rule, eta times the sum from n equals 1 to all of our values of y n minus w naught transpose. Um, I'm going to get rid of my hats now. Right, so we have some starting weight and some weight on the First, um, <clears throat> on the first iteration through based on the error that we receive, right? And so 
this is equal to what? This is equal to W naught uh, plus eta times X transpose Y minus X W naught. So what I've done here is I really don't want to play around with the summations. So I've stuck all my stuff in a matrix uh, which contains my previous history values. Right, so now I'm using capital X's instead of vectors of X's. So now these are matrices. So I can just do matrix multiplication and get rid of my summations. Right? So I've just, these are exactly the same. I've just gotten rid of the summation. Right? And so W1 in this particular case is equal to the identity matrix minus eta X transpose um, X times W naught plus eta times x transpose y. <clears throat> All I've done is rearrange the equation. I've multiplied my eta through, and I've taken out my w sub 0. I haven't seen that? OK. So if we look at w2, right? w2 is. It's the same equation, right? We update our weights based on our previous values. It's the same thing, except now when we see W1, we replace it with our quantity. So W2 is equal to W1 plus eta times the sum n equals 1 to n. But instead of doing that, I'm going to do it in my matrix notation here, x transpose y minus x w naught, right? And I'll bring my w1's down, right? And so that equals i minus eta x transpose x <coughs> times w naught. Um, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write this a different way. I'm going to write this as w2 i minus eta x transpose x W1 plus eta x transpose y, which is equal to i minus eta x transpose x. W1 was i minus eta x transpose x w naught plus eta x transpose y plus eta x transpose y. Right, all I've done is substitute W1 in in this equation. <clears throat> okay, so if I actually wanted to write W on the infinite trial, you'll notice that this is a series. Right, I can form a rule that describes what this is, and the rule is W at infinity equals the sum from I equals one to infinity of I minus eta x transpose x <clears throat> i minus 1 eta x transpose y plus i minus eta x transpose x to the infinity w naught. That makes sense? Okay. So does this series converge? So this is, in fact, a series. So does this series converge? So you need to know two definitions. First, the sum from i equals 1 to infinity of some matrix A to the i minus 1 is equal to 1 over i minus A, <clears throat> which is equal to